In late 2022, OpenAI released GPT-3. Then, in early 2023, GPT-4 came out, which was a lot more powerful. Now, GPT-4, it's believed, is not just a larger version of the GPT-3 model. In fact, it's believed to be a mixture of experts, meaning that it runs a number of models in parallel, and there's a router that chooses which model is used at inference time. In this video, I'm going to try to explain some of the intuition around mixture of experts, how they work, and what advantages they bring, or might bring, over traditional GPT, that's generative pre-trained transformers. I'll leave a little bit of speculation to the end of the video as to why OpenAI may or may not have gone down this route. But for now, let's look at some of the basics. Let's get started. First question is, why mixture of experts? Well, a traditional GPT, like GPT-3, has a large set of neurons. It has large sets of matrices within the language model. And these are trained. And during inference, when you want to create or predict the next token, every single neuron is used. So if you have a matrix of 100 by 100 or 10 by 10 or 8 by 8, like here, every single one of those neurons is going to be used on the forward pass. And what happens is, as your models get larger and larger, you need to use more and more neurons, which means more and more compute. Now, even though you have to run the matrix calculations, there are probably a much smaller set of neurons that actually contribute to predicting the next token. And for a given area of expertise, probably the neurons that are important are quite similar. So actually, if you could rearrange the model in some way, you could maybe think about splitting this single model into eight parallel models. And then when you want to query the model on a specific topic of expertise, you could just query one column of that matrix and run the calculations on that column rather than running the calculations on the entire model. What then if we could split a model and choose the best column of weights to use based on the inputs. This is the idea behind mixture of experts. And to do that, we need to use a router. The idea behind mixture of experts is to take a model and before doing the training, split it into a number of experts, let's say eight experts like here. And then additionally, we need to have a router that decides which expert to call based on the inputs that come into the router. So now, rather than the inputs going directly and requiring us to do compute through all of our model, we get the router to choose which column of the model in this simplified example we're going to call. So as an example, if you have an input vector, let's say it's a token like the token hello, that will be represented in vector form. Here I've got a four dimension vector. And this vector then will be passed into the router. And the router itself is like a small neural net. It's a matrix of weights that is going to then predict which expert it should send it to. So here the router, which is a matrix of weights, takes in this vector and it outputs an expert choice. And the expert choice here is seven. So it's deciding to send this input to the seven language model. Now actually what the router does is it predicts a probability of each of these experts being chosen. And then the most likely expert is the one to which the inputs are going to be fed. So here's a quick overview of how the training would work in a mixture of experts. You start off and you have your eight models and they're all separated and initialized. You also have a router here that chooses between them. So the router will take in a batch of inputs. It will make a prediction on which expert to send it to you will forward pass through the neural net and generate some output token predictions. And then you calculate a loss, which is the actual token that should be there in the training minus the actual prediction. And you use that loss to back propagate all the way through the neural net here of experts, but also then you back propagate through the matrix for the router. And so when you train a when you train a mixture of experts, you're simultaneously training each of the experts and you're training the router. So you're teaching the router how to decide which expert to send it to, 
and then you're individually teaching each expert. And what ideally should happen over time is that the router will learn to send to different experts for different expertise, and those experts will specialize in those areas of expertise. And now the benefit is that even though you've got the same size of neural net as in the traditional GPT transformer, you instead have got much quicker inference because when you go to inference time, the router is just going to pick one of these experts to go through and you're going to have approximately one eighth the amount of compute to do when you go to inference. But there's a big problem with training mixture of experts and that's the problem that you can get a very strong expert and seven other weak experts. If you just naively set up training, the router will start off, you might get a package of data get sent to expert seven. Expert seven, um, there's some back propagation that updates those weights. And just through random chance, some initial experts can get very expert. And because they're getting better, the router now wants to send more of the data to those experts. And you, so you get this non-uniformity in the training of the eight experts, whereby one of them just takes off. And once it gets ahead, the router is not going to want to send any more data to the other experts because that single expert or maybe two or three experts are just pulling ahead of the pack. This is a problem because what you'll end up with is you'll have one very strong model, let's say model seven, but then seven other weak models. And even though this model seven might be strong, it's got a lot less weights than the original GPT, which had all of these weights for its training. So you'll end up with just one strong model with a relatively small number of weights compared to uh, a much stronger model that will have the benefit of using all the weights. So you need to find a way to solve this problem and get the training of all the experts to be uniform so that at the end of training, the router is going to evenly distribute across um, all of those experts. And of course, that's going to depend on the data set as well. So if the router is uniform across, let's say, a coding data set and uniformly sending chunks of that evenly to the eight experts in a specialized way, that won't necessarily result in a uniform pattern if you move then to a literature set of data. And so the design of the router then is, and the uniformity of distribution of data is going to depend on the data sets that you want to run at inference time. But there are a few tricks um, that have been used in order to smooth out this training. And the first trick is to add noise or randomness. So instead of just taking an input vector, putting it through the router to predict an expert choice, you add in some randomness or noise. So if you can think of it like if the, if the router itself is predicting for probabilities, let's say 0% and then 100% for expert 7 and 0% for expert 8, what you would do is add in uh, some randomness here. So you might bump up all of these probabilities to something like 0 0.25 and then you'll stochastically pick which expert is going to be chosen from that distribution. So basically by adding noise you're saying the expert chosen during training only is a function not just of what the router thinks is good but also is going to be somewhat random and what this does is it sprays the data a bit wider across the experts and it stops them it stops some of the experts from not getting any data at all because the other ones have pulled ahead in performance. Now the next trick here is to apply a penalty for uneven router choice. So when you forward propagate through the network, I said previously you calculate a loss. There's nothing different here to traditional GPT. The loss is the difference between the actual tokens um, and the actual next tokens and the predicted tokens by the network. So you keep that loss, but you add on to it a penalty for uneven router choice. So basically you're saying, okay, router, if you are not distributing your choices evenly amongst the experts, I'm going to put a penalty term into the loss. And that is going to back propagate through the network and influence the router in a way that it's incentivized to distribute the data uh, uniformly across all of the experts. Now, to be clear, when we're incentivizing uniform distribution, 
we're not incentivizing random uniform distribution. The router still needs to segregate the data according to the best expert. And the reason for that is because we're penalizing based on the actual tokens minus predicted tokens. And to minimize the overall loss, it will be beneficial for the router to use specialized experts. So the router is being incentivized to make decisions based on A, maximizing uh, specialization so it benefits the whole network, and B, maximizing uniformity. And with these tricks, you're able to get to a situation where uh, for a given data set, you've got relatively uniform distribution of data, a uh, relatively uniform distribution of strengths of the eight experts. And you also will then usually have data that is relatively uniformly distributed between the meta-inference time. I want to cover two questions now of where mixture of experts is useful. First of all, first of all in edge devices like say laptops and then at scale if you're running like OpenAI or Anthropic or Mistral or any of those. So here, the question is whether mixture of experts is useful for laptop inference. So you can consider a standard uh, GPT model here. Maybe you consider a small one that's quantized. Uh, for example, maybe you consider a Llama 7B model and it's quantized down to, let's say, three gigabytes um, of space required on your VRAM. And if you go to a mixture of experts, you're still going to have the same number of weights in total. So actually, you may not save any VRAM. You may still have a model that's of the same size for the same performance, roughly. However, when you run inference, so when you forward propagate through the network in the mixture of experts case, you're only going to use one eighth of the compute that's required and one eighth of the memory lo loading as well through the inner cache of the GPU. Whereas in a standard transformer, you're going to have to load all of the weights through um, through those that final compute step. So the answer is yes. I think that using mixture of experts, all else being equal, will give you faster inference on a laptop. It, it should give you faster tokens per second. However, it's not going to make the model any smaller if you're aiming to keep uh, a model of the same performance. Next up, uh, does mixture of experts reduce costs at scale? So th the motivation here is, is very similar. Basically for a model of the same size, you're going to be able to do inference at some fraction of the cost. Uh, if we split into eight experts, you can think of it, it's not exactly, but you can think of it like one eighth of um, the tokens, token compute required at inference, or uh, conversely, you can think of it as eight times the throughput. And I think the way you set this up, if you're at scale, is you're going to have a GPU that's dedicated to each of the experts. So you load the model weights for each of the eight experts, probably on eight GPUs. And then when you get batches in from customers of data, they're going to go through the router. Um, at each step, there will be a decision from the router where that input goes. And you will get many inputs from many customers. You will take a batch of inputs destined for expert A. It will go to that GPU A. Uh, you will get an output token and you will come back and repeat the process. So again, um, not again, but rather if you're doing inference at scale and you want to make the best use of your GPUs, you're going to need to have a high volume of requests from your customers like uh, OpenAI easily does. And that allows you to batch the queries. That allows you to batch the queries together, not just batch them together as they would already do for GPT-3, but additionally, to put them through the router and then rebatch them according to which experts they need to go to. Now, um, I addressed and kind of solved the problem with, with the training of mixture of experts, the problem of trying to get them of uniform strength so the data is evenly distributed. But this in itself, the solution, which is adding in noise and adding into the loss function, the solution in itself results in the networks being somewhat slow to train. The fact that we have to add in this noise, it does keep the data more even between the experts, especially in the early phases of training, but it's not efficient because ultimately 
the router is sending data to places it doesn't want the data to go. And anytime you do that, it's going to slow down training because really that data, let's say on the Apple, should have gone to expert two, but the noise is causing it in this case to go to expert seven. And so I think for a mixture of experts, intuitively, the training process is going to be slower than if you're training uh, a standard GPT. And just in a few slides later on, I will show uh, some data from an academic paper that covers the training time for mixture of experts versus an equivalent model of the same uh, number of weights that is just a standard GPT. But interestingly, and it's a paper from this year, maybe the idea had been around before, there is an improvement upon the mixture of experts that gets around this, this issue of having to use noise during the training. And that's called fast feed forward networks or also binary tree networks. So rather than here, like mixture of experts, just having eight in parallel, you can set up this kind of a tree-like structure. So you start off with inputs at the bottom and you have a router that just chooses left or right with some probability P. And let's say it chooses right, you get to another router and it chooses between left or right with probability P, let's say the left. And then at the very uh, top or the leaves of the tree, you have experts. So you can see the difference here is that instead of just having one router that decides between these four experts, you have a two layer structure. Or if it was eight experts, you'd have a three layer structure where you have these binary routers. And in this case, the routers are simpler. They um, also will take in an input vector, but the choice they have to omit is simply a one or a zero with probability P. So they're just predicting a probability P of whether to send that input to the left or to the right. And this is why it's called a binary tree. And the nice thing about binary trees is, and I don't have a fundamental explanation for why, but it seems empirically, at least with the vision transformer papers, that when you train a binary tree, you end up naturally getting a better distribution of data feeding forward through the network during training. And that leads to the experts being more balanced and not needing to add in this noise or kind of force the network towards a certain configuration, which is one of the core challenges in the mixture of experts approach. And so you can get to a similar training time as a standard GPT, but you of course can get faster inference because although you have to train uh, feeding forward, you'll train with probabilities feeding forward and um, back product propagating losses. During inference time, you're just going to make one choice. So the router will say probability of 0.9 to the right, since that's larger than 0.1, we're just gonna go right probability of 0.6 left, we're just going to go left. And so we're only going to actually run the inference on one of these leaves of the entire model rather than running it um, on all of the possible neurons. And here's that graph, um, not graph, I keep calling it graph. Here's the table um, from the paper. I'll provide a citation down below on fast feed forward networks. And they have a nice comparison of a standard GPT, which is a feed forward approach a mixture of experts approach, and then the fast feed forward, which is the binary tree. Now, this is a bit overwhelming, so just uh, follow with me and I'll focus on small pieces of the table. In all of these cases, the experts or the leaves in the case of the binary tree of experts, the experts are of width uh, 32, and that is going to be held fixed. And what's been varied here is the total width of the network. So if the width is 64, that means you've got two experts and in the binary tree, um, it's actually going to be equivalent to a mixture of two experts. Then if you have 128, that's going to be four experts. So now you've four experts in the mixture of experts and for fast feed forward, you're going to have two layers because it'll be four going down to two um, with a router in each place and then going down to the bottom router. So here, what's been varied is uh, the total width of the network. And we have some evaluation metrics I'll go through now. So MA, this is a measure of the model's ability to memorize. So basically the ability to encode information into the model, higher is better. ETT is um, the epoch, epochs to train. It's how many epochs you have to go through an amount of data to get to this metric here of memorization. 
So it took 307 epochs to reach 87 as a score for memorization. G is a bit like M, but it's a measure of generalization. So it's if you train on data set A, how well does the model do on related data sets, but not ver verbatim the same. And ETT is again epochs to train. So here it took 55 epochs to train this feed forward network with a width of 64 to 49.3. Okay, so what we want to do now is just compare the feed forward and mixture of experts. And what you can see here is that it's possible to train a feed forward network to a memorization of 87.2 in 307 epochs. But for the mixture of experts, the score is lower. It's only 57.8, and yet it took 5,354 epochs. So it's taking a lot more training time in order to reach a lower score for the mixture of experts. Now, if we compare the fast feed forward or binary tree, here we have a score of 85.8, so pretty similar to 87.2. And so for a similar memorization score, it's taking 307 epochs to train the feed forward, but it's, on, but it's taking actually roughly the same 302 to train the fast feed forward. So this is saying the same point that I made earlier, which is mixture of experts take quite a long time to train. Whereas with a binary tree approach, you can train in roughly the same time as a feed forward network. You get a little penalty on the performance because you have less connections within your network. Having eight separate experts is less connected and less flexibility than having just one very connected network. But you really get quite close in terms of performance and your inference speed, which we look at in the next slide, is really what improves if you move to fast feed forward. Here is a comparison of fast feed forward with just a standard GPT or a standard feed forward approach. For our baseline, we have a feed forward network, which is a width of 128. And what we're comparing then is a fast feed forward network with a leaf size going from 32 all the way down to one. If you have a leaf size of 32, you can think of it like eight experts. And then if you have a leaf size of one, then you can think of that as 128 experts. And what you can see here is that as you add more leaves, or rather you add more experts, same thing, you're getting a speed up in performance. It's true that you're adding uh, more nodes. You need more routers, but the routers are quite lightweight because they are typically just one matrix that predicts one output of whether to go left or right. So you add more routers, but you now only need to run inference on a small leaf of the model. And so you get these significant speed ups as you move to having more and more leaves. Now, I want to give a big caveat here, which is that this is for much, much smaller networks than what you would see with GPT-3 or GPT-4. And so I'm not sure that the, ex the results extrapolate in terms of the sensitivities, but I think directionally and around the intuitions, this seems um, to be plausible. Basically, if you have a, feed fa a fast feed forward network or a binary tree, you're going to get faster inference because you're using less of the network at every time you do inference, but you should be able to train in a similar amount of time. However, in a mixture of experts approach, you might get some faster inference, but the trade-off is it's going to take you longer to train because you have this randomness that's needed in order to distribute your data and the strength of the models. To recap things off then, let's come back to the, well, one of the original questions, which is why does mixture of experts or fast feed forward work? Well, in standard GPT, you use all of the neurons and they're all within a given layer. They're all very connected. So this first neuron here would typically be connected to every single uh, neuron that's ahead of it. I've only shown two here, but I've shown that it's connected to one on this side on the left and it's connected to one on the right. Whereas if you look at a fast feed forward network, you can see that we're no longer allowing any connections over to the right-hand side or this side here of the network. We're just allowing connections. And this is a trade-off. So you have less connectivity, you have less degrees of freedom if you decide to separate your ne network into kind of shards from the start. That incurs a small accuracy loss. However, you are getting a roughly one over N speed gain I'm not sure it's exactly one over n. It's a bit worse than that. But intuitively, you can think of it as if you split into eight shards or eight experts, you're aiming for that kind of 8x improvement in inference time. 
but you are taking a small accuracy loss. Um, and this is what ultimately justifies or might justify the use of mixture of experts or binary trees. Why then would you go to mixture of experts or maybe these binary trees instead of just building a larger model? Well, I don't really know, but let me give you a shot. Let's say you start off and you're building GPT-3 and you're scaling that up to support many customers. You probably start running GPT on many servers in parallel. You have H100s or A100s and you're putting them in parallel so you can support larger context length and so that you can get higher speed. Now, at some point, I imagine the networking between those, even though it's improved a lot, that still probably ends up being a limit. And so as you make your model, your GPT model larger in size, your inference is getting slower and it's maybe becoming harder to keep up good tokens per second by adding more GPUs if you're running into this bandwidth constraint of ne needing to shift information between all of the GPUs you're using to serve customers. So my sense is that if you keep making the model bigger and bigger, maybe the problem you run into is inference speeds for customers. And you can give some trade-off in inference speed, which is what has happened with GPT-4. It's slower to produce tokens. You can give some trade-off, but probably there's only so far you can get as the speed gets down towards reading speed or some multiple thereof. So at that point, you start to look for ideas that can improve inference. And the ones that are known are speculative decoding, where you use a weaker model to predict tokens ahead. And if they're correct, as proven by the stronger model, then you keep them and save time. Um, there's a good tweet by Andre Carpathy on that. And the other method that has come out, I think, is mixture of experts, which hopefully you can see a bit from this video, does allow you to improve inference speeds. Basically, by forcing the model to be trained, you can think of it in shards and reducing the inference time by roughly one over the number of shards that are being used. So that's my best guess, but I very much doubt that mixture of experts is being used in naive form. As I pointed out, and as is known in literature, you need to introduce noise. You need to have a loss function that's going to incentivize even training of experts. And perhaps this binary tree approach is a more robust and kind of natural way that mimics maybe how roots evenly pull water from the earth or something like that. So I suspect there are very many tricks that are learned and many more problems I'm completely unaware of as you try and scale the mixture of experts approach and whether the feed forward networks using these binary trees end up being better is something that also would have to be tested on much larger models. Cheers, folks.